The assigned reading for today was to read chapter one, which was the chapter entitled The Peculiar Community, but um, I just want to mention to you, if you're not someone who reads the introduction of a book, you should go back and read the introduction to this book as well. In fact, I'm going to talk a little bit about some of the stuff that came out in the introduction, because before I even got to chapter one, I was very encouraged and challenged and motivated in the study to take a look at what was going on inside of there, and just... And using that introduction of the book, I want to kind of introduce what we're going to be doing over this whole session here, because it's just such great content. See, this week, we begin an interesting part of the journey. When we started, for some of us who started in the fall, we began with talking about how do we understand God? What is God about? What is God like? And how does what we believe, how do our narratives about God, you know, how are they congruent or how are they not matching up with the narratives that Jesus teaches us, that Jesus reveals who God is. And that was the whole purpose of the Good and Beautiful God, that first book in the series. And then after we completed that, we took a look at how do we envision success? What does a good life look like? What should life be like in my heart and in my relationships? And we took that and we put that alongside of Jesus' teaching as to what success in life is supposed to look like in the Sermon on the Mount. And that's the whole point of the Good and Beautiful Life. But now we come to this place where we're going to start talking about how we live in community, how we live out the great commandment, that second part. When Jesus said, here's the greatest commandment, love the Lord your God with all your heart, your mind, your soul, and your strength. A lot of that stuff you find inside of the first two books. But then the second part of it, which Jesus said is this, love your neighbor as yourself. That's what we're going to be talking about now. We're going to be talking about how we do this. That's what the teachings are going to be about. That's what we're going to be looking at later tonight. We're going to be looking at practices. In fact, these practices, even more so than some of the practices we've done before, are practices that involve our relationships with others. And here's the thing that I think is really important to remember when we start looking at practices both ones that we do in terms of our personal lives, but also these ones that we do in relationship to each other, that we have to remember the point of the practice is not the practice itself. Sometimes we can get all excited because we did something, but the point of the practice is not that. The focus is on the heart. You know what? If we manage to do a practice and not do it with love, we've not done the practice. There's a difference between taking out the garbage with a spiteful spirit and taking out the garbage because you care for the people in your house. And they can sense it. Have you ever done it the wrong way? Your garbage, you slobs. I took out the garbage, I'm a good man, good woman. No, you were just an angry grump who had to take out the garbage. And the truth is, when we do practices, when we talk about these things, we can do them, but we can do them, one, in a way just to feel like we've done them, or we have to be careful because even acts of prayer, even acts of reflection can be done, maybe not necessarily at a grumpiness, but can also be done in a wrong spirit, and that we expect God to reward us or that we earn brownie points with God because we have done something, all right? It's almost like God owes us a blessing because we've done the right thing. And we can miss the point in that regard as well. Because the point is to focus on our heart and our relationship. If our relationship with God is growing, these things become natural pieces and extensions of our living in Christ's world and in Christ's ways. We have to watch that our good works don't become a distraction or a religious shell. And that's one of the things we talk about in the introduction of the book. But there's also something here I just have to say, and I have to agree with James Bryant Smith when he said it, For most of us, the problem is not that we're turning our good works into idols. For many of us, the challenge is this. We're not producing much good work. Ephesians 2, 8 to 10 is a great passage. I remember memorizing much of this one as a young child. In fact, I memorized verses 2, uh, chapter 2, verses 8 and 9, where it says, For by grace you've been saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is a gift of God, not by works so no one can boast. And that is such an important thing to understand, that, you know, we're not saved by what we do. We're not, 
justified before a God by anything except for the blood of Jesus Christ and his sacrifice and what he's given for us. And that putting our trust in Jesus, putting our trust in him, that is what saves us. That's the passage I was taught when I was just a young boy to know, and it gave me such security to know that. But many times we forget that the very next verse after it says, you are not saved by works, it's by grace. No one can boast, but it says, but for we, why are we saved? For we're God's handiwork, created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which God prepared in advance for us to do. See, we are saved not by what we do, but we are saved and brought unto God with a purpose that we can bring his kingdom and his life to his world. You know, we are called, we are called to bring Christ's kingdom into the present as it comes present into us. And we also have to be mindful that and this is the thing when we talk about acts of righteousness and good works and what we're supposed to be about. There's these two banks that we can kind of push towards. There's two kind of positions that we can kind of lean towards. And some people lean a little more this way and some lean a little more that way. There's some churches that really think that if you're a Christian, if you've got faith, it's going to demonstrate itself in these kind of works in terms of acts of justice, in terms of care for the poor, in terms of and acting things for the needy and speaking up for righteousness and justice in the land. So people say, that's what it's all about. And that's what we're going to focus on. If you're not doing that, you've missed the boat. There are other people who say, you know what? Ah, that stuff, it sounds just like social activism. Where it's really at is it's all about prayer and it's all about life and it's all about being in the word and it's all about these things. And the people who are the most social activists just say, you're kind of pious and full of yourself. You need to be about this. And the others say, no, I need to be about that. And the truth is, if you read the Gospels, if you read the stories of Jesus, the stories of Jesus and the truth of God's kingdom is it is a kingdom that involves action for people in terms of justice, and it involves a relationship with God and personal piety. And if you can't try and have one of those without the other, you create an imbalanced faith. James 2.17 says this, faith by itself, if it is not accompanied by action, is dead. You know, we place our trust in Jesus. We have this relationship with God. And out of that relationship with God comes an understanding of God's world that causes us to embody God's world and bring it present into this world. And as we see Christ's kingdom come on earth as it is in heaven, more and more and more, and we seek to seek God's will in our world, in our day. We are drawn back to the heart of God to seek and say, what it is that, that you wish for this world? What is it, like Nora said, am I listening to the Spirit to hear what I'm supposed to be bringing to my world today? And as we live those things out, we celebrate and rejoice that, and we go back and it's this relationship we have with God that's supposed to come evident into our world. It's supposed to come evident into our kingdom. Just before I get to chapter one, I have to say one of the coolest illustrations I found that Smith used in the introduction of the book was how he talked about how every day I bump into several different kingdoms and queendoms, as he said. See, my world is a little kingdom, a place where I have influence, a place where I have sway, and then I'm going to bump into other people. I'm going to come in contact with other people. I'm going to come into contact with the, the kingdom of the Tim Hortons drive through person. And I'm going to be, my world is going to brush up against theirs. And it's going to come in contact with the people who are with me in traffic. The people who are with me many times at my workplace or in my bowling league. And the place where you're probably going to have the most chance to bump into somebody else's kingdom is in your home, in the relationships where you live and with those whom you're most intimate. And the question comes, as we can come into contact with these kingdoms, are we connecting with them? Are we colliding with them? Are we just passing them by? And here's the thing. As believers, as apprentices of Jesus, we are called to bring the reign of God, the kingdom of God, with his grace and his life and his blessing 
into all the kingdoms with which we come in contact in greater or lesser ways. But that all begins by seeing ourselves rooted in his kingdom first, making him king of our domain so that when I bump into Aaron's kingdom afterwards today in conversation, I'm able to connect and bring blessing to that as opposed to crashing my kingdom into him and bowling him over. That's the vision. When we talk about the good and beautiful community, the question we want to ask ourselves is this. As we live in community, are we bringing Christ's kingdom, which we seek to Christ's rule, God's rule in our hearts, are we bringing that rule into the contact of the others whom we touch every day? Or are we crashing into them or just ignoring them and not seeing the opportunities we have through the Spirit to connect Jesus to people's worlds. Which is what takes us now into chapter one. In chapter one, we actually introduce the whole book in this chapter one by talking about the peculiar community. And here's the question that comes up. Is there a difference between the community of the Jesus followers, of Jesus' apprentices, and the world, the people who are not Jesus' apprentices? Is there any difference whatsoever? And sometimes we wonder. Honestly, you have to say this. I'm a, I'm a pastor, but you don't have to be a pastor to wonder this sometimes. Sometimes you look around at the people who are with you in church and you say, are we really all that different than people who are outside? We have similar struggles. We have similar health problems. We have similar financial issues. You know, when you take a look at statistics for for problems that you find in society, you find them in the church. You find issues of abuse in the church. You find issues of disappointment in the church. You find issues of dishonesty amongst the people who sit in the pews of a church. You do. And if you're around long enough, you find these things. Or even if you never find them, the stats about things that are hidden that people do studies on in church world find these things too. But here's the interesting thing is that while we find there are many times similar problems, you know, in the church, we expect there shouldn't be. Smith talks about how if, you know, you hear about a business person who has a, an issue of infidelity in their life, he's like, oh, whatever. But then if you hear there's a pastor or a spiritual leader in a church that has one of those issues, it really because of something that people who don't believe in God feel like they can weaponize more readily, and people on the side of the church are more hurt by it because we expect a difference. And here's the thing I just want to say. While we may feel this, like sometimes is there a difference or is there not? Among those who are apprentices of Jesus, if you've had a chance to experience authentic Christian community, and that's not to say there isn't struggles inside of that, there is a difference in the people of God. The whole expression of peculiarity uh, Smith got from the King James Version of 1 Peter 2.9. And I remember memorizing this one was a small child as well. It says, but you're a chosen generation. Actually, it was a song when I was a kid. Does anyone remember that song? The, all the people as old as me and older remember this song. You are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation. And then you kind of draw it out, a peculiar people. Yeah. You know, everyone remember that? I should have brought my ukulele tonight. We could have sung it. It would have been a lot of fun. Show forth the praises of him who has called you. And we'd kind of bounce too, actually. It's a whole song. But we're, we're a special people. We're a set-apart people. We're a different people. We're called to be that. But the question becomes, how are we different? How are we supposed to be different? I'm going to be honest with you. I've been known for much of my life as a bit of a different person. And when I was in middle school, uh, my dad got into Hawaiian shirts. And actually, we got a big sale on Hawaiian shirts at this place that's going out of business in the Fredericton Mall. They could have been, back when there was a Fredericton Mall, you have to be really old to know what that even was. And maybe it was going out of business because it sold so many Hawaiian shirts, but we got a great deal. And suddenly, because my family didn't have a lot of money at the time, I was the Hawaiian shirt guy. And I liked them. I thought they were cool. 
my, some of my contemporaries did not find them as cool as much as they found them peculiar. But I got used to it, and I kind of enjoyed it. But here's the question. Are we peculiar because of the way we dress? Are we peculiar because of the way we look or the way we eat? Or does it mean we're just supposed to be weird people? Those Christians, they're the weird people. And you know what? I've met some weird Christians. Truly have. But there's actually a really great quote in the book from a, a, a great saint called Athenagoras. Here's what he said. He said, this is what distinguishes believers. He says, their citizenship is above in the heavens. They obey pres prescribed laws, like the laws of the land. But in their own private lives, they transcend the laws. They show love to all men, and all men persecute them. They repay curses with blessings and abuse with courtesy. And for the good that they do, they suffer stripes as evildoers. What I really found was such a great expression was that our citizen is above in the heavens. We obey the laws of the land, but we transcend those laws. What makes a believer a peculiar person is not because we eat different food than our neighbor. It's not because we wear different clothes than our neighbor. It's not because we speak a different language than our neighbor. It's because we belong to a different place than our neighbor. Our home is beyond this home. And honestly, I'm going to say something. When churches start to get off tangent and off base, it's when they try and make themselves more peculiar. So you know what? We're going to start enforcing that everyone's got to wear this or look this or do that or speak that. Or we can only read we can only read it in old Dutch or old German or old King James. That's what makes, we, this is the way we speak. And there's nothing wrong with think, reading things in old ways or if you feel led to wear something, then God bless you for that. But when we start to make our distinctiveness, these things, we lose touch because the kingdom of God is a kingdom that goes to every nation, every tongue, and every tribe, and every culture, and every place, and embodies itself incarnationally in those spaces at the same time while being above and beyond all those places. That's what marks us. What marks us is not because we wear peculiar clothes like flamingo shirts on Sunday. What marks us is that we are the people of the peculiar God. The indescribable, unique, one of a kind, revealed, one true God. When I was back in university, I actually took a class called Literary Myth and Symbolism from a professor, uh, his name was Alan Bentley. He's passed away now. I remember Alan, great guy, had many great conversations with Al. He's been an eccentric fellow too. Uh, and the whole premise of that class was that Greek mythology and the, new, and the scriptures, the, the Old Testament and New Testament, were the underpinnings of English literature. And so the goal was to say, we're going to study the Greek myths in the Bible and see how that the themes are woven throughout English lit. It was a great class. It was an English class I took, really enjoyed it. But through that, I had an opportunity to spend a lot of time studying uh, the Greek gods. I had to read about Greek mythology in addition to have, lending my thoughts about scripture in this class, which was a lot of fun as somebody who knew the Bible. But here's the thing. I remember reading about the Greek pantheon of gods, and here's the thing that you realize when you look at the Greek pantheon of gods or reading about Roman mythology or you actually read about how gods are understood in some other cultures in their, their writing is that you realize that the God of the scriptures is unique, truly. The God that is revealed in Jesus is unlike anything else. When you read the Roman gods, you basically open up yourselves to a human soap opera with superpowers. It's so-and-so slept with so-and-so and killed so-and-so and that's how time came to be or this came to be or there's this demigod and somebody burned so-and-so and someone hated so-and-so and did this to so-and-so. 
And that's what the Greek mythology was. But when you read about the God of Israel, the God who reveals himself, who says, I'm not part of some collective or some big kind of community of gods. I am the one true God who created the heavens and earth, and I'm going to prove it to you in delivering my people from Israel and in sending my son Jesus to reveal who he is in his death, burial, and resurrection. You find there is nothing like him. He's like a mistreated father that longs for his son to come home in Luke 15. He's like a landowner who is so generous that he says, I'm going to pay a full day's wage to the person who only worked one hour because I want to be so generous with people. I want to give so much away. He reveals himself in Jesus who becomes as we are to die for our sins and take our place. See, we bear the peculiar people because we are the followers of the peculiar God who is generous, who longs for a relationship with people and does not cut them off when they've spit in his face. Because we serve the Christ who sacrifices himself for the other. As it says in 1 John 4, it says, Beloved, if God has so loved us, we ought to love one another. No one has seen God at any time. If we love one another and God abides in us, his love has been perfected in us. You know, if we want people to see the difference, it begins by realizing that God has loved us. We live out of the love that God has poured into us. And because of that, his love will abide in us and we can bring it out. His love is perfected. Now, not since that it's incomplete, but it's like it's made mature. It's come to its purpose when it's put in our lives and lived out between us. I think that's why Jesus says, this is how they'll know you're my disciples, because of your love for one another. They won't know you're my disciples because of the clothes you wear. They won't know you're my disciples because of the way you cook a steak. They won't know you're my disciples because of how pious you are. They'll know you're genuine because the love that existed between Christ and the Father it's from the beginning of time. That harmony in the Spirit exists in us. It is poured out through us. And when people look at that and they see a community like that, as James Bryant Smith talked about when he was a young man who walked into that inner varsity kind of fellowship thing happening on his campus, he says, I've never seen people so variety and so different and so in love with each other and love with God together. There has to be something real to that. I think about the times I've managed to sit around in a circle group, in a community group setting, and I sit and I look at the people who were in the room with me. And it happens over and over again. I've been in part of groups for many years now. And I look at the people who were in the room with me, and I said, if it was not for Jesus, I would not be in a room as diverse as this. If it was not for Jesus, I would not know most of you. And yet here we are, and there's this love and this affection that grows between us because the spirit and the love of Christ has been in, placed in each of our hearts and we live that out together. That's what makes us a peculiar people. Because we serve this God, we become, as Smith says, we become a maladjusted people. We become people that just don't fit in with the norms of this world. You know what? I, Nora referenced when she's giving her testimony about the practice for this last week about the gentleman who was not sure if he should wear a sword on his belt. And his mentor who says, well, wear it as long as you can. And I think there's such wisdom in that. In fact, I love that. My, one of my favorite chapters in all of Scripture is Romans 14. And if you've heard me before, you've heard me talk of Romans 14, which is a passage where Paul is talking to people about meat sacrificed to idols. And some believers said, you can't eat that because that was sacrificed to an idol, and that would just be, it'd be like not loving God properly. And then Paul, some other people said, an idol's nothing. If somebody sells the meat on sale because it was put in front of a stick of wood, like, I don't care if it's a stick of wood, a stick of wood's nothing. I can eat the sale meat and then give some more to the church. I'm happy with that. And what Paul taught in that thing, in that setting, is he was talking, we need to be so in tune with the Spirit, to say, Spirit, what is the right thing for me to do in this setting? 
Now, there are absolute laws and absolute things that we can and can't do, but here's the thing that I think Paul teaches inside of that. There are definitely laws, like the Ten Commandments, you know, it's like, I feel led of the Lord to commit adultery. Like, you know what? No, you're not. You're led by something else. And it's not your brain. It's your lower brain. That's not being led of the Lord. There are definite laws, but there is also tremendous liberty in Christ. We need to trust the great work of the Spirit. You know, we become peculiar not because we make all the rules, but because the Holy Spirit of God that lives inside of us grows us. As I was getting ready for today, I actually thought about my kids. I have four children, great kids. Um, In my world, sneakers are a big part of what I have to deal with. Because it seems like every year, and sometimes every half a year for some of them, their feet just grow. And then those shoes that I bought them in September, come next September, they're just not good anymore. Why is that? Because their feet grow. Their feet grow and they start rubbing up against things and getting uncomfortable with what was once a spacious, comfortable shoe. Suddenly things are not comfortable anymore because I'm rubbing up against something that doesn't fit with where they've grown to be. And here's the thing that'll happen to us as believers. If we, as we become more alive and full of the Spirit, there will become things in our life that we start rubbing up against that they were comfortable before. They were comfortable before, but it's not comfortable anymore. There'll be practices. In fact, I think about Colossians 3. I, I didn't write this in my notes, but this... I think there's a reason that James Bryant Smith selected this as again like his key passage for the study. So I'm just going to add this in right now. Colossians 3, Galatians, Philippians, Philippians, Colossians. I love how he said there, put to death whatever belongs to your earthly nature, sexual immorality, impurity, lust, evil desires, and greed, which is idolatry. Because of these, the wrath of God is coming. He said, you used to walk in these ways in the, once you, in the way you once lived. So there's something that got uncomfortable in your life at one point. You used to be this way, but now the Spirit has led you out of that. But then he says, here's the thing, once you're through that, but now you must rid yourself of all such things as these. These are the next things that are going to get uncomfortable in your life. You might have been pleased that you're no longer sexually immoral in keeping what it said up there. But are you getting uncomfortable with anger and rage and malice and slander? Filthy language, lies. Are you putting on the new self, the new shoes, the life that is in Christ, our creator? As we look, begin this study into the good and beautiful community, it begins by understanding that God calls us to be a peculiar people. And that means in the spheres of this world, there are gonna be places where we just don't feel like we fit. And that's okay, because you don't. One more thing, we're going to talk about next week's soul training exercise. Next week's chapter is called The Hope-Filled Community. And we're going to be talking about how we have the hope of Jesus Christ and how we're naturally supposed to be a people who share that hope. So I love the byline of this, and I'm going to encourage you. It's on pages 59 to verses 63 in the book. And I'm just going to turn there. It says, sharing your faith, in the little parenthesis, without embarrassment or coercion. What a great byline, eh? Um, And here's the thing I really want to say. It talks a lot about the importance, and it has a whole bunch of steps. But the thing I want to mention that I think is really the starting point, and you should go give this a read, and begin praying about it this week. The first starting point in sharing our faith is to begin to be watchful and praying for who God is putting in our life. Step one. And if, if you just start with that and say, God, who are you putting in my life? Who's the person that's opening up to me? Or who's the person that seems like they're willing to talk or the person who's willing to share or the person who wants to hear? And begin to start that conversation In the chapter next week, we're going to talk about other times we share our faith very expressly and overtly. And sometimes, like Nora was mentioning, sometimes we do it just 
through our life, and those things are legitimate ways of sharing our faith. But we want to be intentional as people who are not trying to sell people a bill of goods, but are trying to share the hope that we have found. And so step one, and this is thing I really encourage you, read the description this week, give a look at it, but it begins by prayerfully saying, God, who are you giving me opportunity with this week? And here's the other thing. And the other thing is that what I mentioned about this exercise. You know, maybe you'll lead someone to faith this week and you'll start at the start and end up all done this week. But don't feel like you have to force. This is the without coercion part. Maybe you're starting a conversation that'll go longer than this week that'll still bear the fruit of someone's life coming to Christ. Because you can't force the process. So give it a look, give it a read, but we want to be people, and here's the thing, we want to be people who share our faith. And many times, as Christians, we feel intimidated or we feel like we don't know how to. And we want to talk a little bit about that next week. So next week, we're going to be reading the chapter, The Hopeful Community, chapter two, and we're also going to be talking about sharing our faith. And so I really encourage you in that. Be blessed this week. Thanks so much. God bless you. See you later, my online friends. God bless. Goodbye. Patty, take us offline if we're not offline. I'm going to tell the in-house people something. Um, one of the things I want to do, just because I know you guys are here, um, one of the things I'm trying to do this time around with my class,